Okay, I think you all see my presentation now. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, all of you, for being here, both uh, in person and online. And uh, thank you, Sylvia and Joao, for inviting me to uh, speak here in the joint seminar and seminar of the center, but also in the joint uh, seminar with the uh, Iberian Network. Um, I'm going to present something that's relatively uh, new for me. So it's the first time I'm presenting uh, this work. It's related to my previous work, but uh, it's uh, a part that I've been only working on in the last, uh, um, last few months. And um, it's entitled Mechanisms and Dispositions in Evolution Lessons from Ivo Divo. But since we, not all of us have a background in the philosophy of evolution, I think it's better that I give a brief summary overview of what's uh, my broader project here at uh, uh, CFCUL. Um, so my project is called Evolutionary Propensities Under Evolution. And uh, very broadly speaking, my work um, is trying to bridge two big debates in the philosophy of evolutionary biology. So in, in the philosophy of evolutionary biology, there's these two uh, big debates that have been going on for over like two decades. And on the one hand, we have the extended evolutionary synthesis debate. Um, on the other hand, we have so-called causal statistical debate that's about causes in evolutionary models. and um, with regards to the extended evolutionary synthesis debate, what's debated is uh, what's the nature of explanations in different evolutionary domains. So evolutionary biology is not homogeneous, it's a, it's a set of different fields. Um, and also what's discussed, it's the level and the desirability of theoretical integration uh, within those or across those different disciplines that compose evolutionary biology. On the other hand, uh, in the causal statisticalist debate, um, we have um, a very um, well, intense debate over whether or not the uh, notions in evolutionary explanations are of evolutionary change or not. And we all know a bit about um, is, um, is it a cause of evolutionary change or is it an epiphenomenon that uh, emerges out of lower level causes. And uh, here there are different views about what the model represents. So do they represent causes or propensities or, or do they represent merely the frequencies of changes? Okay, so for us to have a better idea of what the extended evolutionary synthesis debate is, here is a diagrammatic representation of um, <laughs> of uh, the domain of evolutionary biology. And um, in the very center, we have three concentric circles. In the, very, uh, in, in the smaller uh, circle, we have uh, uh, the combination of variation, inheritance, and natural selection. This is all that Darwin talked about uh, in his work. And this is the classical uh, uh, Darwinian view. Uh, but then uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, this Darwinian uh, theory combined with the new theory of genetic inter in inheritance. So what we have in the so-called modern synthesis of evolution is a combination of Darwinian natural selection and genetic and, and Mendelian genetics. And we have there the models of population genetics, of quantitative genetics, et cetera, et cetera. This has been called the modern synthesis and it's been ruling for years. And now the discussion is how to include other things that have been uh, growing around uh, uh, the, the classical uh, picture and that are not so uh, typically uh, combined in theoretical terms uh, like Ivo Divo theory that I'm gonna be talking about, but also other things such as niche, niche construction, the idea of, of developmental plasticity or multi-level uh, ways of selection. Okay, um, curiously, the, the causal statisticalist debate, the other one, has only been focused on the models of the modern synthesis, the models of the 20th century evolutionary biology. 
And what I do in my project is to try to apply those ideas, those discussions that are very familiar for most uh, philosophers of, of evolutionary biology to the broader discussion about whether or not we should extend the synthesis. And in particular, uh, um, it, with regards to evo -divo. So what are classical models and what are evo -divo models? Um, here um, uh, we have our representation of the three levels at which we can uh, describe uh, a population evolving. Uh, we have the genotypic level, the level of the genes that uh, represents what's inherited. Um, we have the phenotypic level, which is the level of, of the morphology that we have, so we don't, uh, um, which is actually what selection sees. Selection doesn't see, uh, this is always metaphorical, of course, but selection doesn't uh, um, see directly the genes, they, uh, it sees our phenotypes. And then we have the survival value, both of the genes and of the, of the phenotypes. Okay, so the classical models, uh, we have two different times, they use different combinations of these things. They, they, they focus on, dif on different levels uh, um, in, in this layer representation of populations. On the one hand, uh, the models of population genetics, they map genes directly to fitness. So they assign a fitness level to the genes composing a population. We have here a toy representation of what it does. So what, it, what the models of population genetics do is to um, predict the change in the, comp in the genetic composition of a population only based on the fitness values of the, of the genes. So if we have um, a, very, um, a very fit gene, that's the red gene in this uh, representation, uh, and we have natural selection acting on the population, then uh, in the next generation, there will be more uh, red uh, genotypes in the population uh, than in the previous stage. Um, on the other hand, we have quantitative genetics model, uh, which do a similar, but not exactly the same thing. Um, what they do is they map directly the phenotype. To the, to the fitness level, but they totally ignore the genetics because basically, because we don't know uh, how it works. And uh, what they do is to predict changes in the phenotype, in the shape. For instance, they predict uh, that by selecting a bigger corn, um, um, we will get even bigger ones in the next generation. Um, and we don't need to do any genetics for that. We just sort of assume it. So if we have the same, uh, uh, well, not the same, but a phenotypic red uh, uh, advantages variant, what we have, if we have selection for that trait is that there will be more variation in the trait in the next generation. Not only we're selecting, but we're generating more variation um, um, in the same uh, range, like with the core, when you produce even bigger cores than in the generation before. So this is what the classical models do. And what does um, Evo Devo says? Well, we have here assumptions about how the variation behaves uh, after a, a, an episode of natural selection. We don't have a real treatment of how variation works. Um, um, Evo Devo, with regards to this, mostly focuses on the so-called problem of variation. We have uh, on the one hand, direct mapping from genes to fitness. On the other hand, direct mapping from, from fit, phenotypes to fitness, but we never have a real knowledge of how genotype and phenotype uh, uh, do relate. So EVO-DEVO is the short for evolutionary developmental biology. And uh, what it tries to do is to combine insights from evolutionary biology and from developmental biology. Why would development be any important to evolutionary biology? Development by development here, I just mean, uh, well, just I mean <laughs> the process uh, from a cycle to an adult form. Um, why would this process matter? Well, because it is the process that links the genotypes that are inherited with the phenotypes that selection sees. So the, the point in EvoDevo is that knowing how that process works, knowing how the development of multicellular organisms work, is important for understanding how variation is generated uh, in each uh, uh, episode of natural selection. 
Um, so the point is that um, the acquisition of characters matters, not only how they are genetically inherited, and that variation is not random because it's determined by development uh, in a way that the space of phenotypic possibilities, let's say, is determined by developmental properties. Okay, so getting back to the broad uh, uh, picture of my project, what I intend to do is to expand the causal statistically discussion that's only be fo being focused on uh, uh, modern synthesis previous models to the evo devo discussion over evolutionary variation. I believe it's a fruitful way to understand the challenges that evo devo uh, uh, means, but we don't need to go into much detail there. This is just the general framework that I wanted uh, uh, to present. And uh, having said that, I'm gonna um, talk about the um, my the well the part of the project that I've been recently uh, working on, uh, which is related to the mechanistic view both of evolution and development. Okay, so this is an outline of the things I'm gonna be talking about. Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm gonna present the problem of evolutionary causes and how you would go interest the scene. And then I'm gonna talk about mechanisms in development, in evolution, and the way they're usually seen in evil devil. And finally, uh, uh, to, uh, at the end, I will give a different perspective of how to understand evil devil causes, not only in a mechanistic way, um, um, that I believe is a bit more fr fruitful um, for understanding the, the uh, connections between evolution and development. Okay, so evolutionary causes. Evolutionary causes are um, usually talked, um, referred to as ultimate causes. This is this leads back to Ernst Mayer, who in the 60s um, um, separated or talked about two separate domains of biology. One is the proximate domain and the other is the ultimate domain. And the proximate domain uh, um, questions has questions about how uh, um, biological systems work. So the example Mayer used is the migration of birds. So the domain of so-called proximate or functional biology um, asks things such as how do birds do, uh, migrate? What are the mechanisms underlying uh, their migration? So there are physiological causes. There are causes that have to do with the, their ecological um, um, relations. And uh, we can and, and we can talk about those causes in mechanistic terms. But when one asks why do they migrate, they, we're asking something different. We're asking what's the evolutionary story of that trait? Why is it that birds migrate rather than not migrating? Why are they doing that? And um, for explaining these things, we don't use so much mechanistic explanations. We use explanations in terms at Mayer's time in terms of forces. This has been very much debated, but the idea is that they're different from the proximate um, causes. And these forces um, are natural selection, are evolutionary uh, genetic drift, are mutations, and they are migrations. <clears throat> Why does Evo Devo, evolutionary developmental biology, pose a challenge to this idea? Well, because it's, it talks about how approximate cause has an effect in evolution. It talks about a reciprocal causation between proximate uh, mechanisms and evolutionary changes. Um, another, I think more intuitive example is uh, also the field of niche construction where, where the very organisms build their own niches affecting their selective pressures. So they're not um, only uh, passive to the environment, but with what they do with their proximate causes, their own mechanisms, they affect also their own evolutionary fate. Um, and with uh, development, we can see it uh, with this idea of causal completeness. If we want to have complete causal picture of how evolution takes place, we need to consider development. Why? Because in order to achieve a modification in the adult form, evolution must modify the embryological process. 
responsible for that form. Therefore, an understanding of evolution requires an understanding of development. Uh, this is a quote from Rome uh, Amundsen, a historian and a philosopher of uh, Fibo Divo. So what we have with Fibo Divo is a different type of explanatory abstraction within this causal complete story of evolution. We can have the classical models uh, focusing on the phenotypic level or on the genotypic level. Um, but Ivo Divo focuses on an um, intermediate level, on the level of how uh, genes relate to phenotypes. And it asks this, the question about how do these developmental processes change in evolution? And uh, something that Ivo Divo biologists do is comparative developmental biology. So how um, do we see instantiated the same developmental processes uh, or mechanisms in different species. And they also use their data for phylogenetic uh, uh, reconstructions. So developmental data is very useful for understanding uh, the phylogenetic relations of, of between species for constructing the tree of life. Um, and the curious thing is that uh, in theoretical treatments of Ivo Divo or advocates of Ivo Divo, because that's another story, but it, 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 there's kind of like a part between uh, <laughs> Ivo Divo is like a more classically inclined people. Um, but in theoretical defenses of Ivo Divo, um, there are two uh, factors that usually go by hand and that sometimes seem like the two faces of the same coin, which is that Ivo Divo shows development as a causal factor in evolution. And also that Ivo Divo is a mechanistic science as opposed to classical evolutionary biology. So what I'm doing now is to, to uh, ask myself this question. So are these two claims that usually go together actually related? In other words, is it the mechanistic nature of Ivo Divo that brings uh, 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 that shows that development is a causal factor in evolution. Okay, to, to answer that, that question, we need to talk a little bit about mechanisms. So mechanistic explanations are explanations in terms of the, the composition and recomposition of a system. So we have a system that we define functionally by the phenomenon we want to explain. And the thing is that we decompose that system into the relevant entities and the relevant activities that those entities engage in for explaining the, the phenomena um, um, in question. So in this uh, diagrammatic representation, we have the depiction of the mechanism at the lower level, um, and we have uh, uh, specific lower level entities combined or, or, or engaged in different activities among each other. And then we have at the higher level, the phenomenon that these activities are um, explaining. And um, the classical idea about mechanisms is that um, they are nested in a hierarchy. So we have higher level mechanisms and lower level mechanisms. And these lower level mechanisms are the components entities of the higher level uh, uh, mechanisms. And uh, there's also this uh, um, idea that there are different relations uh, uh, when it comes to levels. Um, so on the one hand, we have the relation of causation between entities in the same level. So at the bottom level, we have uh, three different entities uh, sequentially in the in the picture in, in the slide, I mean, um, um, and we can talk about causal relations uh, between those elements. Um, but then, when when it comes to relate those elements to uh, uh, the higher level, um, the relation is not causal; it's compositional. So, the causal relation is temporal, and the uh, compositional relation is not temporal; it's just uh, synchronic and uh, uh, across levels. Okay, is developmental biology a mechanistic science? Excuse me. 
Okay, so developmental biology works by um, um, identifying developmental entities such as gene products, proteins, transcription factors that work in the developmental process, extracellular components, extracellular matrix, environmental inputs, uh, mechanistic components like mechanical stresses of bioelectrical potentials. These are entities recognized in developmental biology as entities, um, excuse me, as components of, of um, development. And uh, what are the relevant activities? Well, the relevant activities are dynamically complex and they're not, uh, um, they're not linear. So we have a causal complex relationship that give rise to, for instance, threshold effects, feedback loops, et cetera. So what's uh, been argued in the literature is that actually uh, developmental kinds of explanations show that this causal constitution distinction is not so clear and that at least in the case of development, uh, the relation is not um, either vertical or horizontal, but a bit of diagonal. And uh, here we're gonna see it. Um, so the, the idea is that in developmental explanations, there is causation across levels, for instance, uh, between um, a lower level um, entity at time one and a higher level entity at time two and toy. <laughs> example is a gene regulatory network at the um, uh, early stages of development and the final phenotype that it explains. Um, this is related to the so-called hybrid nature of development. Um, developmental mechanisms are on the one hand cellular and physical, and on the other hand they're molecular. So there's these different levels of, of um, developmental mechanisms. And one could think that this is just uh, the classical problem of nested mechanisms, that there are different levels and that's it. Um, but the fact is that there is no real correlation or not complete correlation um, between the lower level and the higher level, and not in the sense that it's usually the case, not in the sense that the lower level varies more than the higher level, but the other way around. The, the higher level varies more than the lower uh, level. So I have here that cellular physical mechanisms of development, such as tissue level, mechanical forces, et cetera, vary more for a species than the molecular mechanisms supposedly composing and causing, if we have uh, this uh, diagonal uh, relation, um, then no composing those mechanisms. So is uh, developmental biology a mechanistic science? Depends on the criteria one has for, for what it means to be a mechanistic science, but we can say at least that they use mechanistic leading explanations because they identify relevant developmental entities such as uh, genes. Uh, this is the uh, a representation of the developmental model for, for flower formation for the individuation of flower organs. And we can see how the relevant uh, gene products are identified. Uh, we also have the activities identified, the relation between those entities and uh, the organization. Okay, so fair, it's fair to say that it's uh, uh, in a way a mechanistic science. How about evolutionary mechanisms? Well, let's get back to this. Uh, discussion about statistics from between statisticalist and causalist. <clears throat> okay, statistically say that evolution is a purely statistical phenomena and that the explanatory concepts evolution uses are statistical, like natural selection, and causalists say, well, quite the opposite. It's evolution explained in causal factors. Um, the explanatory concepts in evolution are causes, selection and drift are causes. And uh, what this means is that uh, statisticalists believe that the only causes relevant for evolution are at the level of individuals, not at the level of populations. Here we have again the level relations, uh, the complex level relations. But um, let's say that statisticalists um, uh, claim that the only causes we can talk about are mechanistic at the level of individuals, including developmental mechanisms. Causalists um, um, would say that the causes of evolution 
are acting at the population level and they can be found in um, statistical models. So for statistical least, the extended synthesis even if we included is the only one that can bring fossil uh, uh, material to evolutionary biology by introducing these individual level mechanisms. And while for fossilists, for fossilists, classical evolutionary biology is already a causal theory. So statistically, uh, like this, well, at least to statistically, it's Lucy and Kaplan for them, which are, I, I didn't put references in the pictures, so that's very wrong of me. But um, this is from a book by Peter Lucy and Kaplan, and um, they argue that uh, evolutionary biology or evolutionary classical models work with the shadows of causes, with the statistical shadows of the causes, because the only causes that matter are at the lower level of individuals. So is this the only way that Evo Devo can bring a causal picture of evolution? Well, let's see what it has to say with regards to causalists, to those people who already think that evolutionary biology is already causal, does Evo Devo add any, uh, anything to that picture? Well, <clears throat> there's a discussion about um, mechanisms in evolution, actually. And um, even if um, Mayer said that mechanisms are only <laughs> relevant for proximate causes, some philosophers, not a bunch, but some philosophers have been um, uh, discussing whether or not the terms in evolutionary models can be understood uh, as mechanisms. And um, well, they look totally different from developmental mechanisms. Um, first of all, the discussion has been only constrained to natural selection, not other mechanisms have been discussed, just mentioned in one paper. Um, well, I know, of course. Um, and um, they are functioning functionally individualized. So if we're talking about selection, we're talking about the mechanism, what's the mechanism for adaptation? That's why I put this, uh, this picture of the adaptation of the, uh, I don't have the word for it, but uh, I think it's uh, visible. Anyway, and the um, most developed account considers natural selection as a highly complex multi-level mechanism including in their entities, different levels of entities, so populations, individuals, and even genes, and uh, including in their activities, ecological interactions and reproduction. Okay, but the thing is that evolutionary biology um, doesn't provide mechanistic explanations. It doesn't explain by composing them Oh, that should say decomposing, sorry, decomposing and recomposing um, um, uh, the elements of, of, of an evolving system. Um, it explains by other means, by statistical means, and uh, mechanisms are just a way to interpret the factors in statistical explanations, but not uh, um, a way of interpreting the explanations themselves. Um, so the question to raise here um, uh, from the point of view of the synthesis of Evo Devo is, are other populational level factors mechanisms too? Can development be included there? And um, also are the lower level composing mechanisms also evolutionary causes? So what happens with this uh, inter-level relation when it comes to the evolutionary process? So, um, well, we have these two, Diff very different ideas of, of, of mechanisms in developmental biology and evolutionary biology. And uh, interestingly, when mechanisms have been discussed in the uh, intersection of both in, in EVO, EVO, in evolutionary developmental biology, the discussion has mostly been concerned with the constitution of vibration, and in other words, with the problem of homology, with the pro problem of what is the same unit across species, such as an organ, a cell type, or a, tr or a morphological trait. In this case, what it means, uh, uh, what makes a flower be a flower, 
um, what makes a vertebrate limb be a vertebrate limb. And these uh, traits show variability, but they also show um, um, very um, important structural features that are shared. And um, in Evo Vivo, there are two concepts of homology, one is mechanistic and the other one is called the organizational mod, uh, um, homology concept. And uh, very briefly, of course, the mechanistic homology concept uh, postulates that the same uh, trait, the same phenotype is explained by the presence of the same developmental processes. This is problematic because we saw there's no correspondence between levels. Um, so what they postulate is that there's a lot of variation in the inputs and the outputs, but there's a causal structure shared in the way the inputs and outputs um, are, are, are related. And um, also they're level specific. So if there's a cell type, there's a specific mechanism for the cell type. And if we're talking about a tissue or, or an organ, there's a, a, a character they're called character identity mechanism that acts at that specific level. And here we escape the problem of non-correspondence between levels. From the point of view of the organizational homology concept, well, uh, traits are not retained because of a shared mechanistic uh, um, basis. They're shared because of an organizational role they have in the entire body plan and, develop in, and also in the way it develops and in the way it's inherited. And, um, and interestingly, the idea of the same unit is completely independent from the mechanistic composition of the trait. Um, actually, the autonomization of the, um, um, of the morphological unit from the mechanisms underlying it, it's what constitutes an, uh, a novel trait. And what's understood here as a mechanistic process is the process of autonomization itself and the process of innovation itself. And this is um, the other part where evo devo mechanisms are uh, considered, which is how do novelties arise? Uh, how do we get from here to here? What are uh, the different stages? Can development tell us something about that? So what we have for explaining uh, novelties in the Evo Devo is what's been called lineage explanations. Um, these are explanations of how a mechanism can change over time. I have here changes, but I should have with can change. Um, and that, well, this relates to what I said before, a different uh, focus in the explanation uh, in, in evolutionary terms, but Maybe that doesn't matter so much now. Um, anyway, what we have for explaining novelties is um, postulations of changes in mechanisms. So um, here we have the diagrammatic representation of, of Brett Colcott, who introduced this, uh, uh, these explanations. Um, I mean, he, he realized that this was a different kind of explanation, but the explanations were already there in the scientific literature. And the idea is that we have a series of mechanistic explanations for phenotypes, of developmental mechanistic explanations, and we um, relate one mechanistic explanation to the other because they are a bit similar, because the changes from one to the other are kind of gradual. Here we have um, um, an example of how different letters make up a meaningful word. And um, um, the, the word scale turns into the word plume by uh, small changes in the world, in the world, in the world um, and which gives a series of stages of meaningful words in between. So in other words, there's a dimension in which each mecha uh, developmental mechanism explains a phenotype. So each um, set of words Constru uh, builds up a word, a meaningful word, but there's also a continuity requirement, a continuity dimension, that is that one mechanism to the other can only change very gradually, very, very little. So that is plausible that one mechanism turned into the other. But here we don't have a mechanistic explanation of how these changes occur. We just have 
a series of stages that are mechanistic independently and a criteria for relating one to the other. There's several mechanistic explanations. This is all. This is what we have in uh, uh, discussions over evil evil mechanisms. So, um, of course, simplifying, but I have to say it all. Um, so, we don't have a real combination of developmental mechanisms with higher level evolutionary processes. We just have um, individual mechanisms and plausible changes and plausible ways in which. Uh, the different mechanisms constitute a character or, or other. So we have a kind of evolutionary view to developmental mechanisms, but we don't have an interaction between the de developmental mechanisms and the evolutionary causes. And um, I would call this, um, um, this is of course arguable, um, a compositional rather than causal relation between development uh, and evolution. And therefore, I uh, conclude that the uh, mechanistic view of evo Devo is not sufficient for grounding that development is a cause of evolution, which is what I was asking at the beginning. So what can we do to say a little bit more about the causal relation between development and evolution? Well, um, this has been uh, asked several times and posted in different ways. Uh, one way that I like uh, to stress is uh, this quote again by Amundsen, uh, that there's a difficulty of integrating the population thinking of evolutionary biology with the mechanistic thinking of developmental biology. And also this other quote by Matsuka that um, phenotypic organizations, that is developmental organizations, differ from organism to organism in such a way that the, it's meaningless to speak of phenotypic causal structure as opposed to selection. There's something general about selection that's not, that cannot be said uh, uh, of development. Development cannot be generalized as other uh, evolutionary factors. Uh, we just need to empirically build a model case by case. Well, this is not actually the case. Um, evil evil explanations are of other kinds, not just mechanistic. Um, there are population level notions that are helpful for bridging the developmental view with the evolutionary view, in particular, uh, dispositional ideas and mathematical models of possible phenotypes based on, on um, developmental dynamics. And here we go back to the three layers. Um, we had the classical models, genes to fitness or phenotypes due to fitness. What evil um models do is genes to phenotypes. And um, they do so by the genotype phenotype map. <laughs> and the genotype phenotype map is a mathematical tool. It's not a mechanistic representation. It's a mathematical tool um, that assigns a particular genotype a vari variant to a particular phenotype as a way to study the, um, how uh, variation can be generated um, um, through genetic changes, be it by recombination in an episode of selection, be it by new mutational inputs. Okay, this is just to show that the genotype phenotype maps is, is probably closer to this than to the, to the model, but it uh, uh, just to understand the ideas, it doesn't quite matter. And this uh, mathematical representations um, show general uh, um, general properties and um, that are usually called variational tendencies, and they can be thought of as dispositions, not uh, uh, without a mechanistic uh, description of any uh, uh, system. Uh, for instance, we have the variability of a genotype phenotype map where any um, um, genotypic transformation, any mutational input will produce a different phenotype. But we have the quite opposite. We have uh, developmental systems that are very robust and we represent it mathematically from, uh, in this way uh, by mapping very many uh, different genotypes to the same phenotype in a way that no matter that there are many uh, mutational inputs, the phenotype will stay being the same. 
Um, we have modular uh, maps where variation in one uh, trait is independent from variation in the other. And we also have plastic maps where the resulting phenotype will depend on a different, uh, on an external, uh, usually environmental var variant. Um, okay, so these variational tendencies are general tendency instantiated in all times of developmental systems. And um, there are general propensities analogous to the world of fitness that also has a bridging role between ecological lower level uh, um, causal mechanisms and higher level um, um, models of population dynamics. And um, so uh, the idea, final idea that uh, I, I want to, to present or that I would like to discuss is that we can add um, um, an additional um, thoughts at the evolutionary level that has to do with development, what we may call the variational tendencies uh, of developmental systems. Having said this, is there a way to understand this mechanistically at a higher level, just like selection is understood mechanistically uh, from, uh, by some uh, philosophers of, of, of evolution? Well, the only say that can be said or that I can say so far is that the functional individualization must be those entities and activities that organize, uh, uh, produce evolutionary novelties in population and that bias phenotypic variation in reproduction. So this is a different phenomenon from uh, what produces selection and what produces drift and what produces uh, mutations would be more discussable. Uh, that's an interesting point. I haven't, I would like to, to discuss too, if you would like. Um, and the relevant entities, again, would be like this uh, complex multi-level uh, mechanism of selection would be, the, the entities would be similar, populations, individuals, genes, but also, and importantly, developmental properties. And uh, the activities would be Similar as well, ecological interactions, developmental processes, but also an important labor production with modification. So the next generation has a change, has a new phenotype that didn't have the previous generation. And uh, the open task uh, to be done is to combine these alleged higher level evolutive mechanisms or these possible higher level evolutive mechanisms with other higher level uh, evolutionary mechanisms like selection or drift. And uh, to sum up the, uh, the conclusions, so evil evil mechanisms shall not be reduced as they usually are to developmental mechanisms in evolutionary perspective. We can have a higher level idea of what a developmental, sorry, what an evil evil mechanism is as, as a mechanism for uh, innovation and biases in variation. And uh, also dispositional and mathematical approaches to in evil evil enable a bridge with evolutionary, with more classical evolutionary explanations. And uh, that uh, the causal role of development, I believe, doesn't follow from the uh, classical mechanistic view of evil evil at least. The two main uh, evil evil contributions, the causal view of development, sorry, the causal role of development, the um, mechanicism, are not uh, directly related. The one doesn't follow from the other. And the agenda of Ivo Diva needs to integrate mechanistic thinking with the positional and mathematical explanations too. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.